All right, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, so my name is Sydney Marshall. I am a curator here at University Museums and uh, basically I am in charge of the Art on Campus collection. Um, and this semester have done um, the exhibition in uh, the Christian Peterson Art Museum um, in the downstairs gallery, uh, which is called Art of Fabrication. Um, and so this, uh, this program is kind of in connection with that to get some more information. That exhibition will be up through uh, December 15th, so the last day of school at Iowa State. Um, so definitely feel free to, to um, come back and, and view the exhibition. Um, but today we're going to be talking about public art as a process um, and really how uh, the very the many different phases of that process as we go forward through um, commissioning and everything else um, in that process. So first I'll do um, an introduction to the three of us. And as Alicia mentioned, if you have questions through um, the talk, please submit them in the chat and then we will um, answer those as we, at the end. All right, so I'm Sydney Marshall, I'm the first one. Uh, <laughs> I am a curator and I have been mostly in charge with the Art and Campus collection here. And then we have uh, Dan Perry and Ronaldo Correa Diaz, and I have their introduction. Um, so, let's see. All right. So, Dan Perry um, is an award winning inter interdisciplinary artist based in Waterloo, Iowa. Over the past 15 years, he has exhibited his artwork across the country in over 50 juried and group exhibitions, as well as 12 solo shows at notable venues, including the Des Moines Arts Center. He has also completed 15 large-scale public art commissions through, throughout the region. Um, Dan also serves on several public art committees and works to educate the public on the importance of the arts and how communities can integrate arts in meaningful ways. Currently, Dan teaches sculpture and is the coordinator of the Public Art Incubator at University of Northern Iowa. And then we also have um, Ronaldo de Correa Diaz, um, an artist from Puerto Rico, who seamlessly weaves together his background in architecture, industrial design, and art um, to redefine public art. Um, he had received his bachelor's in architecture and a master's in industrial design from Iowa State University. Um, and Ronaldo's inter interdisciplinary portfolio spans from high-rise buildings, hospitals, recreation centers, um, products, and international public art across the US and Canada. Um, Ronaldo specializes in site-specific sculptures, master planning, murals, and installations. Um, his work is deeply rooted in community outreach and placemaking, um, and is guided by his artistic discovery methodology, which emphasizes people, story, and place. Um, his commitment to hands-on making and interdisciplinary collaboration shapes and compels um, narratives in his art. Um, he uh, basically, we, he integrates the digital fabrication and design build methodologies, providing innovative learning experiences to students and communities. Um, and through the fusion of digital fabrication, robotics, and computation, he pioneers structural techniques that harmonize art with the site, um, fostering a fresh understanding of the environment. Um, Ronaldo currently teaches across multiple departments at Iowa State's University, um, the College of Design and he continues to spearhead uh, nationwide projects through his private art studio practice, the Ronaldo Korea, Korea Studio. Okay, so those are the three you'll hear from us. Um, so to start out basically um, from the university museum side at Iowa State, um, we're gonna focus on kind of the art of building this collection, the art and campus collection. So university museums is comprised of multiple art museums, um, the farmhouse museum, so a historic house museum, the sculpture garden, and then the art and campus collection. So that's what I'll talk about today in terms of, this is very much focused on public art. We have one of the largest um, public art collections on a campus uh, site in the country. Um, we have over 2,500 works of art installed in public spaces. Um, and with that, we have a kind of unique method of collecting and making this collection as it is very focused in public art and very site specific to the campus. Um, we have a few examples of some of the kind of iconic works of art on our campus. Um, and really, as this collection has grown, it has um, developed different needs, right? So you have to commission the, these works of art and then continue to make sure that the, uh, the works of art are uh, safe and um, conserved for the years to come. Okay, so in the creation of a uh, public work of art, we have a kind of unique 
method um, in comparison to maybe purchasing an existing work of art. Um, we have this practice of essentially creating a committee. Um, so this example that I have up on the screen now is from a recent one where in 2020, um, the College of Vet Med um, had a fish tank lobby that they wanted to um, liven up with public art. And so a committee is made for every commission of public art on uh, in our art and campus collection. Um, and essentially they are made up of users of the space, professors, students, um, staff members within the College of Vet Med or wherever we're making the work of art, and they are tasked with writing this public art statement. And this really is a way to kind of customize and make a really personal work of art um, for the site that is being chosen. So in this um, site, it was a very long hallway um, that is primarily used for studying, um, and it's right next to the uh, cafe, um, and has traditionally had a fish tank, which I didn't get a picture of, but it's called the fish tank lobby because of that. And essentially, right, with this work of art, um, the statement was listed here. So it's it, they wrote the statement of veterinarians, animal doctors um, have mostly ignored the aquatic animal world. Please call it to our scientific and aesthetic attention. Uh, veterinary school is demanding and stressful. The commons and fish tank lobby will be a communal gathering place and social hub for the college. This place with its public art should inspire the restorative power that art brings to enliven people, brighten and elevate um, the lives of students, staff, and faculty. So I think that's a kind of a nice example of the statements that we have them create. Notice they didn't say that um, it had to be made of metal or that it would have to include specific um, elements or they didn't design it, right? That's kind of, uh, it's a guiding statement for really any artist to be able to um, work from. Uh, so this is the result with Tom Stancliffe's uh, Can I Help You? Um, and so this was meant to be uh, kind of portholes with animals looking out into the students or the students looking into the animals in this long hallway. Um, and it lights up as well and kind of has this playful um, tone, which also includes animals to kind of tie into the fish tank lobby. And then with this, right, the, the artist will have to create a proposal. Um, and so this was kind of the 3D rendering of that at the time. Um, and this is something that then the, the committee looks at and sees if it fits the, that guiding statement. And then uh, it's not always, we have many 3D and like kind of Photoshop related models, um, but in the exhibition, we do have two, um, a few different examples of more uh, three-dimensional and built models. So often, right, and this will help with fabrication of the actual public art, and then also to kind of give an idea of scale for um, the committee and the, the people who are commissioning the public art from the artist. Um, Oh yeah, and so there's a transition. So uh, another, I think, kind of unique way of looking at uh, the public art, very large public art collection at Iowa State University is the kind of almost mini collections that end up happening within the campus. So these I put in examples of, examples for near public spaces like um, the dorms, the dining halls, um, and they all kind of have a different tone, right? So in, in some ways I find it interesting to see what are these committees and these different departments trying to focus on um, outside of the larger collection, right? So I think it builds a really good um, view of campus life. So with these, these are all kind of meeting spaces, um, informal learning spaces and more discussion spaces. And you can kind of see um, they're often much more colorful. They're not really referencing any specific um, research, but much more the idea of gathering together and the learning you do outside of the classroom. Um, and I did another two more examples of this of within the Jardine, the business college, right? So again, they're kind of focusing on um, the more abstract works of art, the manual Neri, but then also kind of as a collection grows, the most recent one was this large mural um, by Rose France and really kind of showing the, the student experience. So often from our point of view, from the museums, you're kind of continuously building um, the view of each kind of department and each collection within a collection to show the different representations of their experience. 
And I have one final one for the College of Vet Med. So we have, again, the, the uh, fish tank lobby, but for them, right, they really have focused on um, the different ways of caring for animals and the animals that have an effect on our lives, which makes sense, right, in the College of Vet Med um, standpoint. Um, and then kind of moving forward, as we have built this collection over the years, um, public art is in public spaces, often outside. Um, they need care and maintenance, just like um, anything that goes outside, right? They, they are meant to stand up to the elements in their construction, but they will always need uh, maintenance. And this is kind of my transition into uh, Dan here, where Often we work with specialists um, and in the museum's role is to maintain kind of on an annual basis, the cleaning and care, but anything that needs kind of major repainting, um, reconstruction or removal and replacement for like construction projects or kind of major care, we work with other organizations um, to do that. Uh, and that kind of helps us to keep the works of art looking to the artist's intent um, throughout you know, the, the lifetime of the their life on campus. Um, and so with that, we I'm going to transition to Dan and then we'll have Ronaldo to kind of speak about both this process of um, conservation and fabrication, as well as both of their experiences as um, public artists. Uh, as Sydney said, I'm uh, Dan Perry and I teach here at UNI, teach sculpture. And I also run a program called the Public Art Incubator. Um, I feel like it's important that I give you a little bit of my background so that you know how I got to be where I'm at. Um, also, um, it's important to note that a lot of these things that I'm going to talk about sort of happen at the same time. So a lot of these things are happening simultaneously, uh, but I've sort of split out my talk into sort of three facets of what I do. Um, so at the very root of things, I am an artist. And so I think about my career as uh, <clears throat> dealing with uh, things from the micro to the monumental. And so the micro part is my gallery work, which um, a lot of it ends up being a lot of playful, whimsical things, a lot of different uh, materials. Often it's time it's biographical. So at the heart of it, I'm a storyteller. Um, so I like to comp, you know, present the viewer with interesting situations formally, try and do different things with materials and space, um, try and uh, engage and give sculpture movement, uh, though it's static. Again, playing with materials, uh, lots of different juxtapositions in terms of uh, telling stories, like uh, especially of my Midwest uh, roots, as you can see here with some of this work. Um, so a lot of my work here that I've done uh, has been biographical. <clears throat> and so moving through all these things at the same time, I'm starting to think about what's going on in my community, what's happening to me, um, how I'm interacting with all those sort of things and how I can reflect those uh, experiences in different ways. Um, I enjoy trying to play with materials and push them different directions, try and give the viewer something to question. Um, also something to think about in terms of uh, what they're looking at, maybe questioning how they're interacting with space, um, trying to find that line where there's something that's a little bit recognizable, uh, but then just enough of abstraction that gives them a little bit more to chew on. Okay, so now more <clears throat> directly to the sort of the content of this presentation, um, talking about how public art becomes uh, part of the community and that sort of process. And so transitioning from my gallery work, I wanted to go bigger. I wanted to try and take my aesthetic to a larger scale, which presents a different set of challenges, not only in fabrication, but also finding uh, outlets and venues to get your work out there outside of the museum. Um, one of the stigmas about artists is that they're creating in a vacuum and that the work that they're doing only ends up in uh, museums. And so what I found about working larger scale and doing public art projects is that it gives the viewer a different experience. When someone walks into a museum, they're already sort of thinking about they're going to be engaging with art. When they see public art in a public space, they're not always... Uh, sure they're going to encounter that and so it's a different experience every time and sometimes it's maybe just for a fraction of a second other times it makes them stop and think um 
the other side of this with my process was I was able to start involving students uh, and uh, in a sort of an educational way that they would help me with these projects. And so uh, the network across the country of outdoor sculpture exhibitions has been a good way to get work out into the world. Um, oftentimes communities, AIMS included, have these uh, rotating sculpture exhibitions where uh, artists can propose artworks and then the city or the community will lease them for usually a year or two um, and uh, get a start contributing to their sort of cultural landscape. One of the first projects that I would consider my first public art project was an opportunity to create the cauldron for the 2010 Special Olympics at the University of Nebraska, which is where I just so happened to do my master's work. And uh, through an application process, I teamed up with uh, my colleague, Tom Stancliffe, and uh, former student, Beth Nyback, to create this artwork. And so um, what I learned from this process quickly is that public art, especially large scale things like this, uh, take a village to, to do. And so we were working with not only the Special Olympics, we were working with a production team, um, designers, and even a pyrotechnician, which is something I never thought I would say as I worked with a pyrotechnician. And uh, trust me, they like to light things on fire. And so um, what I've, the, the, the experience that I got from this was that this artwork that I helped create became the center point for this large event that was witnessed by 18,000 people in this arena from all 50 states, athletes, um, dignitaries came in for these opening ceremonies to see this cauldron or torch uh, lit up to start the um, Olympic Games. Um, so I've done uh, similar projects across the state where uh, different communities such as Coralville integrate public art. Um, here's an example of a piece where it was in con conjunction with the Iowa Writers Workshop, uh, sometimes projects. Uh, develop organically, and this so happened to be at University of Northern Iowa, where uh, some donors had contributed to the library and they wanted to uh, commemorate their donation to the library. And so uh, I approached the group and suggested that I would work with some students to come up with uh, a design that celebrates the library. And so you can see here that the sculpture has a stair step bookcase open book here. So it's a, a column that these staircases wrap around as the students representing the students growing as they learn knowledge and the library serving as the backbone of the university. Other communities such as Marion, um, Marion had a place making, place making initiative where they uh, got a Art Place America grant and they commissioned, I believe it was eight artists to create artworks for a new alley development. And so um, at this point, uh, I've done some projects and this is an example of some, some, some of the fabrication. And so sometimes the, the myth is that the public art just sort of arrives and that's there, but the process leading up to the artwork being in the ground usually is pretty complicated and it involves lots of problem solving because you're creating something that's never been made before. So you're actually creating your own problems to solve. And so finding different ways to do it, um, different ways to fabricate it, and again, uh, one of the things that was happening was I was involving students in this process and I was starting to see in their work in the classroom that these experiences were greatly beneficial for them, uh, not only for uh, the fabrication experience, but just the being around other professional artists. And uh, so oftentimes I would include them in uh, the process of applying for public art projects and designing them, proposing them. Um, different ways uh, to give them different experiences uh, to have these um, unique learning opportunities. Um, the other thing that you find with public art is that oftentimes each uh, opportunity presents a, a different chance to uh, create a new expression. Sometimes it involves uh, a memorial content, uh, such as this one with an Air Force memorial. Other times um, I have the opportunity to celebrate a community such as Urbandale's uh, centennial. And so part of that, uh, again, drawing on my storytelling background in my art, uh, is to tell the story of a community. And so here in Urbandale, this is a, a sculpture out in front of their library. And my intent was to show the history the present and the future of the community. Uh, Urbandale has a background as a rail uh, streetcar um, hub and then including a 
sort of a, a, a version of their street map and uh, this, this abstract expression at the top talking about their future as they grow forward. Um, part of all this too is learning how to move big things, which is pretty exciting. And then also being able to contribute something to a community where occasionally you get people sending you images of your artwork that are way better than you can ever take. So, um, so now to the kind of the third facet of what I do, uh, I teach traditional sculpture classes where, you know, you have a, a group of students that arrive at a certain amount of time and they spend a certain amount of time with you, you work on projects and then the semester ends and they go off uh, and do whatever they're gonna do. Um, so around 2011, my colleague, Tom Stancliffe and I decided to start the Public Art Incubator, uh, which is a, a resource where artists can come to us with a commission project and they commission us or hire us to fabricate the artwork and we pay students to do that. So a lot of the things that this, uh, the Public Art Incubator does is it serves as a uh, resource for not only communities, but for artists to uh, maintain and uh, create new public art. Um, as many people know, public art is a, a booming field. A lot of communities of all sizes from uh, a small town to a large city recognize the economic impact and the uh, place-making opportunities public art provides. Uh, it gives communities an opportunity to create their identity and separate themselves out from others. Um, so a little bit of background about the public art incubator is that we've done over 60 projects. Um, each project is self-sustaining. Um, students participate in each project right alongside professional artists and they get paid for their time. Um, students develop real world skills that they can apply uh, to a career after graduation and each project is unique. Uh, one of the myths we like to dispel is that the artist is not creating in a bubble, but in reality to create this type of work, it requires a village. Everything from the artist to the designer, to the engineer, to the fabricator, to the vendor, to the crane operator, all of those people uh, need to be involved to get these things to become a reality. So our students have gone on to do great things, not only across the state, uh, but across the country. So this map represents a lot of the different projects we've done over the years. Um, also, some of our students who have gone on um, and had their own work placed out into the world uh, that's all over the country. Um, so I'm going to highlight a few projects that we've done over the years. Uh, I just gave this talk yesterday at the Board of Regents, so there's going to be talk about a lot of the state university co collaborations. So um, a couple years ago, the University of Iowa had a commission opportunity that was awarded to uh, actual size artworks, which is Gail Simpson and Eris Georgiadis, who are, are the faculty of the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, and they proposed this abstract mortar and pestle. So the process of this public art starts with an idea and the committee, as Sydney had mentioned, will select something based on what they think will benefit their, 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 their building, their area, tell the story of their place. And so in this case, uh, with the pharmacy college, this mortar and pestle became a, uh, a good idea for them. So we hired a crew of four students over the summer and they fabricated it. Um, from stainless steel ended up being around 10,000 pounds. Uh, it provides a lot of challenges for students because they have to learn how to work safely and how to uh, move large objects safely, how to do things properly. Um, they'll find themselves doing things they never thought they would be doing before. Um, one of those things is moving large objects like this. Uh, it involves oftentimes semi-trailers, cranes, uh, hard hats, um, so here it is on site at University of Iowa. Um, and I remember that install with the students on site there, you know, they're learning as we're doing in a, a sort of a high stress environment because you are trying to pick up something very heavy and you want to get it down in place and you want to do it the right way, make sure nobody gets hurt. However, what happens when a bolt gets stuck? What do you do? Um, you can't panic, you have to solve the problem. So they start learning on how to work problem solvings, how to come, come up with solutions and how to do it the right way, not just um, sort of throw it in the garbage and start again. How do you maintain that? Which is different than a classroom where they can work without the pressure of deadlines and high quality requirements. 
Um, we've also collaborated lots of times with Iowa State University and to create artworks. And one of the things about the process of public art is that even though the proposal may come in as an idea, sometimes the actual fabrication of the artwork may change it a little bit. As in the case with this project with Nori Sada, who's based out of uh, Seattle, a lot of the original design for the artwork was done um, just through uh, email communications and, and phone calls. <clears throat> and so we began the initial fabrication of the turbine structure that you can see here. And she worked with the College of Engineering and Marston Hall to uh, create different objects and artifacts that are suspended from this artwork. And so over the course of the summer, uh, you can see Marie and Abby here uh, work directly with Nori to sort of uh, curate and um, assemble this artwork. So they had a, a real say in creating this artwork. So they're starting to take ownership of these things. Um, and sometimes they're not even aware that that's what's happening until they are able to process the event afterwards. Um, and one thing that will come up later is that uh, uh, this is a, a, a case of an artwork where uh, kind of required emergency uh, conservation help because there was a fire recently in Marston Hall and uh, due to the water damage the ceiling was compromised and they wanted to had to get the artwork out of there uh, pretty quickly and so uh, in a few weeks here we're going to be actually going back down to reinstall this artwork again. Um, other times we're approached by artists who aren't traditionally sculpture artists and that's not to say that all public artwork is sculpture because there's lots of forms of public art However, in this case, uh, Susan Chrysler White, who is a painting professor at the University of Iowa, was commissioned by Iowa State University to create an artwork for the hub, which I think you saw an image of it earlier in Sydney's presentation. Um, Susan basically came to us with some splatter paintings, and we had to try to figure out a way to create it where it was to, able to sustain the Iowa climate, public interaction, um, and be durable for years to come. So we ended up laser cutting a lot of aluminum and fabricating these shapes. And then uh, Susan was able to work with the students to create these custom paint jobs. And here's the crew of students with Abby, Heather, and Sabrina having a great time with uh, Susan. And as uh, Sydney alluded to, conservation is becoming a growing challenge with public art. Um, you know, public art really started as a field in the late 60s, early 70s. And so a lot of the artwork that's been out in the world for quite some time, especially in a harsh climate like Iowa, um, has tested the artwork and oftentimes put it to a, 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 in a condition where it has to be either um, deaccessioned and destroyed or conserved or refabricated. And so in the case of ISU's iconic genome sculptures right on top of the molecular biology building were originally fabricated out of uh, terracotta. <clears throat> and over years of freeze-thaw cycles and moisture, they started to crack. And so uh, there was a danger they were actually going to fall off the building. And so working with the artist, Andrew Lester, we were able to uh, determine it was best to refabricate them out of aluminum. And so over the course of the summer, we refabricated the four genome sculptures out of aluminum. Um, here's Jacob with his favorite tool. Um, but these opportunities and fabrication things, again, you're, you're, you're creating these um, objects that don't really have uh, uh, a historical blueprint, meaning like it's never been made before. Certainly people have made cylinders before, but um, to this degree, how do you find ways to make these things? And so each time often you're inventing new ways to do it. The students have these experiences where they're learning the importance of quality, the importance of time management, the importance of deadlines. Um, and taking pride in their work. And so here they're, they're executing a very complicated paint scheme, but learning how to do it the right way so that it will last forever. And now they're able to get to see their artwork go on top of a eight story building that they had a hand in making. Of course, we don't let the students climb too high up on the buildings because that would be uh, dangerous. Um, other cases here, more close to home here at UNI, uh, one of our iconic, our iconic sculptures, uh, the Acrobats, had fallen into severe disrepair. It was made of fiberglass, which at the time it was fabricated was a fairly new material to artists. And so uh, it's a little bit like CSI. You have to kind of uh, cut into the artwork, do some history, uh, try and find drawings, images from history to determine how these things were made. <clears throat> and then... Uh, with modern technologies and materials, restore it to its original glory, oftentimes even better than it was. 
Um, other cases, uh, artworks that were created at one time, again, the Iowa uh, climate is harsh, Mother Nature Always Wins, which I kind of like how the title is, is Nature's Secret, but Mother Nature Always Wins. And so um, to restore this artwork, we used um, high, uh, high definition 3D scanning technology at the Metal Casting Center here at UNI to recreate these works to create forms that were then cast solid in uh, concrete and now they're restored to their original glory. Uh, the conservation problem extends further than just our universities. Uh, communities around the state um, need help in restoring their artworks. In this case, it was Cedar Rapids had a large scale sculpture that was uh, damaged during one of the floods. And so when an artwork is damaged, and in this case, a 50 year old artwork, they have to decide, do we restore it or do we destroy it and they decided they wanted to restore it and so we were able to restore the three pieces of this artwork to its original state um, even though the artist is no longer around we we're able to use historical documentation to be as accurate as possible um, other times in this case uh, working with fairly notable artists like mark de suvero um, this is for the UN university of iowa stanley museum sometimes uh it is you, you kind of learn through history that artists in the 70s, for example, uh, didn't use necessarily the most high quality material. So the original artwork here was painted with like Rust-Oleum paint. So we updated that with new, uh, more modern um, coatings. So it should last quite a bit longer. Um, some of our recent projects, uh, again, the benefit of this program is we get to work with artists from all over the world, all over the country. Uh, this is Sujin Lim, who is Korean born, based in New York. Uh, she was awarded by the city of Cedar Falls a commission to create this artwork as a placemaking uh, initiative on top of the newly restored levy. Um, and this was fabricated by four female students over the course of the summer of 2022. Uh, and again, learning the process. So we were working with an engineer and some of the requirements to meet the engineer's design. Uh, the students learned like it has to be uh, square. You have to think about moisture. Where's water going to get stuck? How do you prevent that? How do you make these things well enough that they're going to last forever? Um, but then from the student perspective, they start to, uh, again, build a bond with each other. They're learning different techniques that they've never used in a classroom. This was fabricated out of aluminum and uh, all the students on this project had never welded aluminum before, but within a few days, they were all welding it. And um, they also start to build relationships with each other, <clears throat> not only as friends, but as colleagues and coworkers, holding each other accountable, um, making sure that they're teaching each other skills. Uh, oftentimes, the students that have, have more experience spend time teaching the new students some of the skills they've acquired over time. And so, um, again, they build these these relationships and they take pride in these uh, these and ownership in these projects and things that are going to be out in the communities for decades to come. And uh, they have these experiences that are very unique to uh, building their career. Um, we also work a lot with uh, K through 12 schools throughout the state. A lot of this, we do a lot of workshops with middle schoolers and high schoolers. Part of this is you know, part of my sort of underlying mission of, of growing the importance and the uh, awareness of public art and how it can help communities. So we work with a lot of schools where they can design things and we help fabricate them or we just um, try and involve them at some level. So here we fabricated this mural for a local middle school. Uh, we also work with uh, Chelsea Meyer, who's a teacher in Iowa Falls. She's also a UNI alum. She does units with her students where they design uh, monuments for the community and the community selects one. Uh, Chelsea acquires a grant or funding from the community and we fabricate it here at UNI. And so our students here at UNI get the opportunity to fabricate these designs. And so they're learning alongside with these high school and middle school students. This is our most recent project from this past summer where uh, two students designed their artworks and we uh, get to see, they bring them to campus. They get to see how it uh, is fabricated. They can see that these things come to reality. And then from a paper model, they get to see the reality of their artwork coming together uh, in their community to represent their community. Um, and oftentimes, uh, you know, artwork, there's a lot of ways that we design it. Oftentimes we use three-dimensional mod modeling software, 3D printing, a lot of CNC processes. Um, other times it's just good old fashioned cardboard templates like this uh, project here where Amelia 
uh, fabricated an ear of corn that was designed by one of our uh, previous middle school projects. And so she, this is her first fabrication process uh, project. And so she had to learn how to go from raw material to the final form that you see there. A lot of our alumni go on to successful careers, not only in the arts, but they teach, they're designers, they're community members, um, and they continue to do public art. A lot of times they come back here and utilize the, the incubators, such as uh, Tim did here for a project in Bentonville, Arkansas. Abby Headley, who is currently in graduate school at Tennessee, the, did a project as a student for the uh, city of Dubuque. Um, Sarah, who uh, works at the Madison, Wisconsin Children's Museum as a, a preparator, um, she also continues to do public art and come back and utilize the incubator. Uh, Whitney Kibbe, who's a teacher, Beth Nybeck, who is a professional artist in Kansas City who has public projects all over the country. Tommy Reefy came back and did this project recently for the uh, Fort Dodge uh, Airport. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our uh, current students. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times what I hear from them is that they start to take pride and it builds confidence in their work. So you can see them uh, it's like night and day oftentimes after they go through one of these projects, they, they're so much more confident about what they can do. Uh, that's because we, we learn by doing, and a lot of that comes through, uh, you know, creative problem solving. They're students, they're going to make stakes, mistakes, but the important thing is like, how do they learn from those mistakes and how do they make sure that these things are going to be qual uh, qualified or sorry, qual of quality. It also provides them lots of different opportunities to network and uh, build connections. And so upon graduation, they can graduate with an edge, gives them different opportunities to work things. We don't just build big metal sculptures. Sometimes we build silly things like large Mr. Potato Heads for the Children's Museum here locally. Uh, but again, all these opportunities add up and we try and pass on uh, any of those opportunities to students so they can start their careers. So here's Amelia with her first public art project where she went from model to fabrication to final product. Here it is installed locally here at Cedar Falls. And we try and support them with any revenue we make. Uh, we buy materials for them so they can start their career. Um, they build relationships with each other where they teach each other. They taught each other how to do different things. So here's Rachel um, who just created an artwork much like uh, Amelia's and they were able to, uh, to start contributing right away. And so uh, Part of the process is not only fabricating, but it's also building these community relationships. It's also training the next generation of artists uh, and culture makers. And that's what I have. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. That was uh, truly uh, incredible and awesome to, to witness. Uh, the presentation I have for you all today, uh, I titled Creating Connection, the Artist Education process to site-specific artwork. And the way that I thought I'd kind of break it down is basically through three lenses that we use as an art studio, right? Connecting through people, connecting through story, and also connecting through place. And then very quickly, I'll kind of show some future work that we have in the makings. So I, I think I need to really start why public art as you perhaps listened to Sydney. Um, I come from a background of architecture and industrial design. And back in 2008, I was practicing in downtown Chicago. And I, I really encountered this incredible experience where perhaps many of you who are listening today have been in Millennial Park and there's these two incredible pieces of artwork, the, um, the um, Cloud Gate by Kapoor and the Crown Fountain by Jaume Plenza. And I would constantly grab lunch out there. And I just thought that there was something powerful about these two pieces of artwork, that it didn't matter if you were from the south side of Chicago, if you were from the north, the color of your skin, your social status, people were converging in these pieces of artwork. And I thought back then, wow, it would be incredible to be a part of something like that. Back then, I had never heard the term public art. This is, has taken several years to kind of develop this methodology, right? I call it artistic discovery, where at the epicenter of what we do as a studio, I believe in people, story, and place. And we have kind of these series of steps where the first one kind of takes us through this journey where I call artistic fact-finding, which really is in honor of my mentor, 
where it's kind of really looking at the research and discovery as a means of developing stories and being inspired. I think in public arts, it's in, it's in a built environment, you really need to understand project goals and the vision that each project kind of entails. Then placemaking becomes a really big component in the way that you approach public art, where you have all these different factors that you need to kind of coexist with. So in other words, the, art, the artwork doesn't exist as, as itself, but also it's part of a bigger, a bigger scope. The artistic expression, um, making sure that the artwork itself is relaying stories and narratives and that it feels that as though it's part of a community. Fabrication and installation, beginning to kind of now understand those transitions and being able to use new technologies and being able to kind of really pay attention to craft. And hopefully the desire is to create some level of impact through the artwork. So that first lens, right? And I've just chose one project to kind of really portray these lenses. I say connecting through people. I like to say that people are like walking books. When you kind of stumble upon somebody from a community and they have lived in that community for 20, 30, 40 years, um, it's incredible how much insight you can gather from that experience. So this first project is called Ripples, um, AKA the community started calling it Big Fish. And I had the opportunity to work with OPN Architects, Confluence, the landscape architecture firm, and the Hanson Company. And if you've ever been in Johnston, Iowa, uh, now this is pretty developed at this point. This was during that pandemic area or time where they, were, they didn't have a downtown presence and they were relocating their city hall. You can see this large green space. There are these two beautiful canopies that were suggested and this splash pad area that would convert in the winter into an ice rink. So as I, was, as I was expressing earlier, this idea of walking books, as I was kind of conversing and kind of engaging with people of the community, I started kind of recognizing these common themes and the way that the community had this incredible relationship to water from the Sailorville Lake to the Terra Park. And they would describe their memories. And I had the opportunity to tour and witness this. Fathers teaching their sons and daughters how to fish people engaging right through their boats and walking, seeing the sereneness of the water. And nevertheless, that began to kind of really spark inspiration for the development of the story. Looking at kind of the existing species that existed within the water body and beginning to diagram and trying to understand the way that these fish move through the water, the way that um, they would create these beautiful ripples. And they started to kind of develop these metaphors where there was a parallel between a community that was evolving and growing. And we decided to take the bass, the large mouth bass fish as kind of a symbol um, for this community. I was really enamored by this idea of creating a kinetic art piece. Um, and as you can imagine, back then it was pretty much our first one as a studio, a lot of research and development went into this process, but you can see a lot of our R&D and this idea at the beginning, we had no idea how we were gonna manufacture these, but it was this notion that the wind would kind of create this ever-changing piece of artwork. Um, Iowa winter, right? So I think a part of an artist, right, is, is that idea of envisioning, right? So this was kind of uh, the construction of the site and process and beginning to think and, and conceptualize the possibility of the artwork coming to fruition. And you can see there kind of one of my initial sketch of kind of a bit of the idea that began to kind of translate in our studio. This was one of the first kind of renditions we began to imagine this kind of beautiful sculptural form of the bass fish where the tail would slightly rise and beginning to also think about the possibility of creating a spatial experience where we imagine little toddlers crawling down and exiting through the tail of the fish. But also kind of creating a beacon right in this this idea that the artwork invites you in and you can begin to experience, if you will, this belly of the fish and begin to experience artwork 
um, from an experiential standpoint. We also thought about the plaza and how to begin to articulate these ideas of ripples around the ground to be able to help kind of uh, with an ADA standpoint and help individuals that are visually impaired not collide. So there's a practical aspect um, to public art as well. <laughs> the idea of thinking about the artwork and how it translates from day to night. Um, as many of you know, the beautiful sunrises and sunsets of the Iowa sky, and we began to kind of illuminate and create kind of these lighting patterns that at, at dusk and at night would begin to kind of once again provide that transition from day to night. Eventually, as in the first lecture, this idea of detail is extremely important, beginning to kind of conceptualize every single component. How do you bring an idea right to the land of the living? How do you begin to kind of translate those? Um, I like to tell my students that there's gonna be moments in your process that what you're looking for, you're not going to find in the big box store. You have to will it or bring it into existence. So a lot of this, like this entire piece from this kinetic scale, so the piece, everything is custom. And those are details that we had to kind of figure out. Here you can begin to see kind of that process of fabrication. That's my Dora Estela. And beginning to kind of see, if you will, that spatial experience and beginning to kind of see once again, the idea slowly coming to fruition. A lot of challenges, right? Where we had to kind of uh, uh, use a, a, a lift, right? A, a crane to go over almost 300 feet away so that we didn't damage the existing structure. So you're constantly, every single project is full of challenges. And here you can begin to see now that translation, how the art piece welcomes you into the belly. You can kind of eventually kind of go inside and as these kinetic scales are moving, they also create this beautiful shining sound that was indicative of those walks and those conversations at Sailorville Lake that really, once again, those walking books and how people truly inspired the concept for the artwork. You can see the ripples also on the ground and the articulation of light to begin to create that translation from day to night, the spatial experience into the belly. And this was so beautiful. Like sometimes, you know, you, you kind of get caught up in the journey and sometimes you have to like take a step back. And this was one of those moments where I had the opportunity to step back during the dedication and begin to see once again, some of those initial kind of things or principles of placemaking that I saw back in Chicago being done at a smaller scale, but quite beautifully seeing how people were immersing themselves in the art piece and in the space. The artwork translating from day to night and once again that experience from the inside and hearing those soothing sounds in the water. So the second lens that I wish to talk about is connecting through story. I believe that stories truly have the power to captivate. They inspire and they really connect us. I'm so appreciative um, of my mentor David Dalquis, uh, who was such an incredible storyteller. I had the opportunity to uh, work for David for over five years prior to starting my studio and teaching at Iowa State. But if any of you are avid bike riders, um, he uh, was the artist for the High Trestle Bridge here. And this is a project in Marion, Iowa at the Lau Park that I had the opportunity to work with David. Over 60 ton of core 10 steel, this beautiful amphitheater that cantilevers over 60 foot. And those years that I had the opportunity to kind of really learn through his process um, has really inspired and, uh, um, and has really shaped my practice. And I wanna be able to give honor where honor is due. Several years later, I had the opportunity on that same location to compete um, for the entry sculptural gateway for Lau Park in Marion, Iowa. And again, I was already familiar because of the experience with the amphitheater, but now I had the opportunity um, as one of our kind of early projects to now create a piece of artwork to welcome individuals to this park. Began to examine, I think a lot of placemaking is really allowing the site to really inspire and to begin to kind of see where you can begin to tap into stories. So in this case, 
the natural environment was truly the essence where I'm coming from Puerto Rico, tropical, totally different fauna and flora. Now I've been living in the Midwest for over 20 years and to be able to learn about this incredible beauty that we have here in the Midwest um, was something that um, I came with fresh new eyes and learning about the native prairie plants and the way back in the early 1800s about 75 or 85% of the land was fully covered by this beautiful um, fauna, right? And this beautiful plant species. And now we have less than 1%. So I came across the research, right? Of John E. Weaver, who was a botanist and a professor as well, who would cut these beautiful trenches in the Iowa landscape and in Nebraska. And he would study these roots and create these incredible drawings. And that began to kind of really serve. Sometimes the work of other people can really inspire you as well. Um, National Geographic did something very similar where they cut roots. This was also, this was kind of in, here in the Midwest. But they photo these 20 foot right long prairie grasses and, and, and their root system. And it was just incredible the way that these root systems in, were kind of rolling and spiraling. And that really became the inspiration for the art piece. Thinking about it as a cycle understanding, as we know in the Midwest, the prairie fires and how this, this species reemerges, And that's kind of how it came to fruition, the idea for the art piece, Prairie Revival. These were some of my initial models. So again, the same thing I tell my students as well, um, the, the tangibility of beginning to kind of also use model making as a form to kind of really understand the relationship of the human body to sculpture, creating spatial experiences, understanding its connection to sight. You can see how also beginning to think about these ideas of dematerializing the metal in order to once again, tell these stories. That was the rendition of the piece early on. And then the challenge is you have an idea, but now how do you build it? And again, I love the, 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 the lecture earlier on, you do kind of encounter so many challenges along the journey. We had to develop a computational script to kind of really understand how to build this kind of Mobius spiral. Even testing it um, early on with you know, aluminum Pepsi cans and trying to see if what we were developing in the computer truly translated into physical form. And here you have a few images of kind of comparing, right? And, and kind of going back and forth between the design and the computer to the fabrication and beginning to examine if you're hitting your datums, um, looking at the way that you're rolling certain pieces and how everything slowly comes together. And it's so beautiful, right? When you begin to see the idea translate into the real thing, how the artwork slowly emerges from the landscape, from the prairie. It begins to reveal itself. Even the footings were carefully designed so that they kind of almost disappear. Um, I designed kind of this mound as well to kind of elevate the artwork and welcome you in. And here you have a sunset in Prairie Revival kind of really welcoming people to the Lao Park. Uh, beautiful, once again, it's spatial experience and the way that it invites people. Another shot of the artwork and its relationship to landscape. My final point is connecting through place. I like to say you should listen to the whispers. This is a, this is a project in Granger, Iowa, um, Polk County Conservation Center, right? So in Jester Park. Um, actually, interesting enough, right next to Sailor Lake. And in this particular instance, they wanted a, also a gateway art piece. And I started to notice, once again, very different from the habitat that I'm used to, the prairie, the wetlands, and the woodlands. And I thought there was something just beautiful. And it was incredible for me to also witness that here in Iowa, um, in this particular location, there's those conservation efforts of bisons and there were elks, and there's something so really beautiful. So as I was walking, as I, as I mentioned, I was trying to capture what I call these whispers and allowing once again, sight to really inspire and to teach you. And as I was walking through the woodlands, I started to discover these kind of pine trees that were dying. 
And as I started kind of asking, you know, some of the naturalists and the individuals who were part of the conservation center, what was going on, you know, we, we, we came across kind of some of these pine trees that were cut in section. And I always knew about annual rings in years, but I didn't know that these annual rings tell stories. When these annual rings were closer together, they were indicative of times of drought, further apart times of plentiful water. Sometimes you'll see scars if there was a fire or if they been plagued by disease, which was the case of this particular um, um, uh, pine tree. So uh, uh, we decided to kind of um, meander more and begin to capture some more of those whispers. I had the opportunity to go with my family and begin to kind of once again, capture the essence of what these habitats were about. So from there, I thought that it would have been an incredible opportunity to leverage my background in teaching. So I had the premise of this idea of creating kind of this tree and these annual rings, but I wanted the next generation to really reflect upon these ideas of conservation. So I worked with the North Polk Middle School and with their art teacher and began to kind of really talk about these habitat and these efforts of conservation. And basically these students became the inspiration, their drawings became the inspiration for the articulation of the artwork. And here you can see whispers of nature, right? This tree-like structure where you can begin to see the articulation. Each one of those three core 10 steel rings talk about those three different ecosystems. The first one, the wetland, the second one, the prairie, and the third one, the woodlands. And those were all inspired by what those students were learning about the importance of these ecosystems and conservation. Then you have these reflective droplets that become this metaphor of a physical and kind of a mental reflection of our contribution to conservation. Some detailed shots of the art piece. So finally, people, story, and place. Um, this is just the way that I have approached, right? Public art for the past year. Every artist is very different, but I think these have been some really um, pertinent kind of philosophies or points that have really helped me to continue to evolve as an artist. Today, we have some really exciting projects. We just installed this one actually quite recently in the uh, Washington, kind of the Metro Washington DC area, Tree of Light. We have this really amazing project happening in Bradenton, Florida. We call it the Singing River, where it's about their folklore and their connection to the Manatee River. Um, a project coming up now in Terre Haute, Indiana, which is such an incredible honor um, for this project where I have the opportunity to work with these African-American settle, uh, settlement that dates back to the 1800s and uh, a piece of incredible American history, free slaves that um, uh, were free before the Emancipation of Proclamation and working directly with um, these descendants to tell this, this story that they're really trying to bring into education curriculum. And this, um, I can't give too much details about this one, but this is probably uh, one of those really exciting projects. Um, we just won an, a really large project for an international airport where um, we're developing these series of playscapes where again, these moments of interaction and pause before you fly to your, to your destination. And this is one we just won uh, for South Dakota State University and uh, where it's kind of a memorial and a tribute to um, McFadden who did incredible research um, that dealt with kind of uh, the genetics of wheat and really um, uh, the preservation, if you will, of bread. So with all that being said, thank you very much. Uh, that's a little bit of, of, of my process. And once again, it's I've been truly an honor to kind of share a little bit of kind of what's going on um, from our end. And uh, yeah, I guess we can open it up for questions. I think that's what's next. Okay, great. So I'm Caitlin Patton. I'm the educator here at uh, the Christian Peterson Art Museum. 
And the main question that we have in the chat is uh, from somebody who noticed that there's a lot of metalworking in both the work uh, Dan does and the work that you do, Ronaldo. Uh, uh, do you work with other outdoor materials and what have been the differences that you found between metalworking and other types of materials? Sure, um, I guess I'll, I'll start that one um, and then we can uh, pass it on to Dan. Yeah, that's, that's a great observation. As you could imagine, um, when you're doing public art, you're, you're working in so many different locations. Like a lot of uh, the initial work of our studio was primarily in Iowa, which is considered in some areas a temperate or a cold climate, right? So you're dealing with these really dramatic, hot, humid summers and really cold winters. So metal just lends itself very well to kind of deal with um, a lot of those kind of challenges. Now that we're kind of doing more work on in the South, now we're having to deal more with salt in the air content and whatnot. So um, the reason perhaps you see a lot of the metal, it, it, it's, it's because of, of just the, the durability and uh, you know, the conversations early on in terms of maintenance. But we have, yeah, so we, we um, a lot of our inter in interior murals, we've done resin, we've worked with different types of plastics, uh, we're getting into glass as well. So I like to say in terms of, of our philosophy, uh, we, we, we typically don't start a project a whole lot thinking about material, but really embracing the journey and allowing the journey to really inform that. We're, working on some installation for some suspended uh, sculptures where all of it is you know, 3D printed as well. So this idea of technology, but um, we're very process oriented in our case, but we do have, I would say the great bulk of our work uh, involves metals. Yeah, and I'd, I'd echo some of the things that Ronaldo said there. Um, metal just tends to be one of the more durable materials, but it's also very uh, pervasive. It's easy to get. Um, you know, it's, it's also something that, uh, in the case of like conservation. So if you, you fabricate something out of metal and 50 years from now, it needs some attention. It's, uh, easier to repair. Um, you know, in some of these conservation cases, uh, climate is a, a, a challenge. Um, you know, especially as, a, a Ronaldo alluded to, uh, here in Iowa, the extremes of the weather we face here, um, you know, if you're working in a dry climate, say like the desert, there's a lot of more mosaic and um, tile work that can happen out there because they don't have to worry about freeze thaw cycles um, and, and a lot of moisture problems. And and like down on the south, salt, you know, the, some of the stainless steel we use here in Iowa wouldn't even work down in, in Florida because of the salt water. So you have to, you know, increase the, the, the protection of it. And even, um, you know, uh, Ronaldo talked about core tan steel, which is something that is a self-sealing rust surface. Uh, even that can can fail over time. Um, if, you know, at one point it was thought to be sort of a, a miracle material because it would sort of seal itself and be good forever. But we were finding that quickly that that's not the case. So um, you just got to take uh, as many precautions as you can during you know the design and fabrication stages to make sure that you can sort of prevent some of those things that can happen, like you know moisture trapping and. Uh, you know, public interaction, you know, if somebody's going to interact with it physically, how do you make sure that it's going to withstand all that? And, and, and metal seems to check all those boxes. So. And I will say not from a fabrication or artistic point of view, but in terms of building the art collection, right. For a lot of our projects, we, we may um, have certain sites that we specifically want to be outdoors or within the floor, which you're probably going to use terrazzo, things like that. But in terms of working with different artists, we're definitely trying to work with a variety of media and different styles but also a big factor in reviewing those artists are are they choosing appropriate materials do they understand the maintenance and kind of where that will be facing them within a campus site so in terms of from the museum sites we're definitely kind of reviewing that as well Uh, if you have any other questions, now would be the time to share them uh, before we wrap up. I, I have a question, uh, particularly of Dan. <clears throat> Since you're a UNI is a public institution, how does the financing work for these projects? For example, does UNI fund everything or does part of the money come from 
the others who want you to to fabricate and when you get get the money for that does it all go to you does it go to the university how does this whole financial system work uh thanks for your question so uh we're technically a fee for service uh, operation. So we form an agreement with an artist. So they have a budget um, that's already been determined by their project. Um, out of that budget, when a, when a public art project happens, there's a, a set dollar amount. <clears throat> out of that dollar amount, the artist has to pay for all the materials, all the labor, insurance, mm -hmm. uh, installation, site work, all that sort of stuff. And so Part of that budget, if the artist is determined for fabrication, that fabrication budget comes to us. Out of that, we buy materials, supplies, um, pay labor to our students, um, and then any other costs we might incur. And now if we have any revenue left over, that goes towards supporting student projects. So uh, if a student wants to fabricate something large scale, you know, it's pretty uncommon for a, a junior in college to have $1,500 to buy some materials. So we try and help support them uh, in those cases. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so we're sort of a standalone operation. We don't use university dollars. Uh, the only funding we really use from the university is uh, the power that we use to run our equipment. So. Thank you. I, I wanted to make a thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, go ahead, thank you. I just wanted to um, shout out to Ronaldo. My name's Conchetta Morales and we, have a lot of the same beginnings in Chicago. Uh, that's where I first started my public art career um, with the Chicago Public Art Group. So, and then I continued through um, Iowa State University and Des Moines, I worked with David Dahlquist. So I have a lot of similarities to you. Also I have public work in Florida, oh. Kansas City. Um, I'm a mosaic artist and I'll get to the point. I, I loved your storytelling and, you know, involving people. So I'm wondering um, if you have town meetings or you get studies from your constituents or how you really involve the people because that was a big part of my work. And I also um, have a piece at the Roberto Clemente High School in Chicago. Wow, wow. Yeah, wow. yeah. Wonderful. Well, as as you as you know, every single project is so different, right? Um, we, you know, and I, I didn't have time to uh, go over some of the design builds that we've done also at Iowa State, but um, I would say that it's it's really through those early or early processes and really discerning. Um, the level of engagement of each client, right? Because everything, each one is so, so different. But in my case, I, I really genuinely love to leverage my, my background in teaching. And every opportunity that I have, I try to, to insert that. So that example that I gave earlier with Whispers of Nature, I, 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 you know, as a father of three children, I said, you know what, I really want to work with middle, middle school children. And as part of my proposal, I embedded that in the proposal that if I were to be the artist that gets selected, I would really love to have this process. Um, in projects that uh, I'm, I'm working now in Bradenton, Florida, it's really kind of um, open forum, which again, could be very challenging as well, where um, you're gonna, just gonna have so many different um, thoughts, processes, and you know, you know, filters. So I've been now a part of two, where it's been kind of open form and really kind of collecting uh, data, collecting kind of uh, local input and beginning to kind of embrace the process, right? And I think that's really, really the premise of it, really kind of going through the journey and seeing where the journey takes you. I'm always reminded of that prairie revival, the spiral one, where initially my, my vision for that piece was all quartz and steel. And through public engagement, they're like, no, this thing should be, a, this, this, this piece should be uh, colorful, it should be vibrant. And I was, I was a bit, to be quite honest, I was a bit hesitant of that. I said, you know what, let's, let's embrace the feedback. 
And I tell you what, I think is it, it looks so much more beautiful. It felt lighter. It, it, it really kind of affected the piece. So um, I guess the answer to the question is every every project is very different, but it's really having that desire of really just working with people. I believe that art and life in general, it's about people and relationships. Thank you. Awesome. I guess an obvious question is, have the two of you ever worked together? <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Yes, yes, <laughs> not yet. Uh, this has been, uh, it's been beautiful. I, I had always heard of Dan. Um, and now I, I, I'm i genuinely um, mind, mind blown. Uh, all these years in Iowa, and I'm like, oh my gosh almost 20 years and now I get to fully um, grasp uh, the work of Dan. So not yet, I, I love that answer. Yeah. All right, I don't know. Do you have any other, any other questions? Doesn't seem like it. All right. So thank you both for joining me. Um, I think this is great. We will have it. So it's recorded. Um, we'll have to edit and then it will be on YouTube on the University Museums uh, page on YouTube. So, um, and it'll be, we'll post it in like our weekly email um, as well. So yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Gracias, thank you. Bye, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Sydney. Thanks, Ronaldo. <laughs>